Caleb here, back again with more I Love Fan Fiction. Today we will be reading a story called Love Letters by Heli Kadate. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, but it's my best guess. On Archive of Our Own in the Sherlock BBC fandom. Warning! This fanfiction contains mind games, blood play, cannibalism, child death, child torture, forced self-harm, minor character death, Necrophilia, non-con body modification, rape, torture, sadism, sexual violence, starvation, extreme underage, horror, and one-sided stalkerish relationship. Chapter 1 The first letter wasn't even recognized for what it was until well after its arrival. It turned up with the other post in a neat envelope, first-class stamp and handwritten address, Dr. John Watson. It read in a feminine scroll. 221B Baker Street, NW16XE, London. Curious, John opened it, read it, then quickly put the pink heart-covered card back in its envelope, with an expression worrying between flattered and embarrassed. Embarrassed was winning. He slid it onto the living room table between some books and a stack of railway timetables, not quite knowing what else to do with it. That night, looking for a book he misplaced, he unknowingly shuffled the car in with what he generally labeled as Sherlock's miscellaneous junk. On remembering the next day and searching for it in the hope that he could hide or dispose of the things so that no one else might find it, he didn't even know if Mrs. Hudson or Sherlock would be worse, he came away empty-handed and stoically concluded that someone had already dealt with it. Sherlock had probably taped it to the outside of the house in an experiment on humidity and ink, or something. After that, he mostly forgot about it, hoping that whoever had sent it would as well. Ten days then passed uneventfully. On the eleventh day, arriving back home from the surgery, John hung up his coat and towed off damp shoes, stretching his back with a gentle, contented noise in the back of his throat. He reached over to grab his mug from the table, still with half a centimeter of tea left in it from that morning, and faltered at the side of his flatmate bunched up on the sofa. The missing card he'd almost but not quite forgotten was in Sherlock's hands and under merciless scrutiny. Do you know this person? Sherlock asked, looking up and saying the words in a sort of half-fascinated, morbid disgust. John shrugged and put down his mug reaching instead to grab the card as he tried to swallow down the rising bubble of embarrassment. It wasn't signed, he said, as admirably as possible. Sherlock waved the card out of reach. Dear John, he recited, tone laced to saturation point with incredulity, there are so many things I want to tell you. I really admire you. Kiss, kiss, kiss. Yes, well, John said, I didn't quite know how to finish. Sherlock made a nasal scoffing sound. Pass me a knife, he said, holding out one lazy hand, palm up. What? By now, he really shouldn't be surprised, but his tone was still colored with alarm. He couldn't help it. No, I won't let you knife it. Somebody put a lot of effort into that. It's... I mean, I'm not keeping it, but no, someone just trying to express their feelings and I'm not letting you cut it up. Wrong. Sherlock snapped and lurched off the sofa to rummage around in the mess on the table. He tossed the card back at John, who caught it reflexively. Look at it! John looked at it. It was a card, pastel pink, and a cut-out red heart on the front. Inside, the words were written in black ballpoint pen. It was a nice card, John considered, turning it over in his hands. Pretty, but not overtly so, lacking any tacky glitter and ribbon. More objectively, it was small, made from an A4 sheet of good quality thick card, folded in half twice. It was handmade with no label or print, 
but professionally done, judging from the neatness of the gluing and the perfect folds. The heart on the front was of some sort of lightly patterned paper with visible fibers. The writing was also immaculate in a curved, elegant hand, and the ink was smooth and dark. Well, he said, then trailed off. It was a card from someone who was good at making cards, but ruled out very little. What else was he meant to be looking for? Sherlock made another frustrated noise and snatched the paper from John's hands, now brandishing one of the kitchen paring knives. Folded twice, he said, and started warming the knife into a crack between the glued-together sides. So, John said, giving himself up only half-reluctantly to Sherlock's brilliance, he hadn't bothered trying to get the card back. He resigned it to being lost the moment he'd seen it in Sherlock's hands. Loads of people fold paper twice when making cards. Maybe she only had a 4A bit of paper and a 6A envelope. 350 GSM paper. No one professional or familiar with handicrafts would fold that twice. And honestly, John, she's ruled in and then erased pencil lines so her writing would be straight. The type of paper on the front for the heart is highly expensive. From the amount of handling it's had, it's hardly likely she scribbled the thing down in half an hour. It's handmade. She wants it to be personal. Important. I highly doubt she couldn't just pop down to the nearest W.H. Smith to get something the right size. That and the glue on the heart is a completely different type to the glue sticking the halves together. It's stronger, much stronger. Someone wants this opened. He gave a wild grin of triumph as the knife slid in and the edges of the card were teased apart, revealing more handwriting. A secret message. How fascinating. Not very secret, of course, but then they did send it to you and only assumed I'd be paying attention. That makes it personal. Something for the both of us. They knew I wouldn't leave it alone. Reader of your blog, perhaps. Must be someone who's done at least a little homework. John sighed and gritted his teeth, but mostly against his rising smile. Go on, then. Enough suspense, he said. He watched as Sherlock finish slicing open the edges, tossing the knife back down carelessly and flipping the paper open to read. And he'd been too optimistic, hadn't he? John pressed his lips together felt the all-too-familiar sinking feeling as Sherlock's smile dropped abruptly and his eyes narrowed, scanning the writing. Well, he prompted, because he could already see Sherlock retreating back into that unfathomable mind of his and likely not returning for hours. You just said it had to do with the both of us. Sherlock's eyes refocused, flicked over to John, assessing. His lips moved minutely, silently. It was something to do with John. Look. John said, starting to feel anxious. Just let me see. The cart tilted two hesitant itches towards him, and he plucked it out of Sherlock's hand before he could change his mind and take it back. John glanced at Sherlock, who only stared at the card in his hand. Suddenly, he wasn't so sure he wanted to know the message. He looked down to read it anyway. Dearest John, he read before Sherlock spoke. Moriarty, he murmured flopping down onto the sofa. It's Moriarty's hand. Somehow John didn't quite register that, kept reading despite his eyes telling him to stop. Stop. I want to skin your hands and make you crawl to me over sandpaper, John. And when you reach me, I'll give you a cuddle and let you choose between giving me off with your hands and giving me off with your mouth. You'll be so brave and I know you won't cry or beg though your face will crumple a bit. I think you'll try to use your hands at first. But even though I'll be so turned on, it will be painful enough that you'll just have to finish with your mouth. Then when it's over, you'll have your own blood and my cum in your mouth and on your lips, John, and that'll be the most beautiful sight in the world. I'll send you home after making sure you know not to clean yourself up before you get back. I might even give you a camera so you can take a picture to send to me of Sherlock's face when he sees you. If you do, I'll keep it forever. X, X, X. There was an awkward, crawling silence. John swallowed, though it did nothing to dispel the nausea sitting in the back of his throat. 
Fuck. He swallowed again. Offer the card back to Sherlock, who stared at it blankly for a second before taking it. Was this a threat? Did Moriarty really mean this, or was it just another sick way of... of what? Was it a clue of some sort? Simple harassment? It had to be harassment. Moriarty was twisted, but he'd shown no interest in John the last time they'd met. He wouldn't start now, or it was a clue. Except he didn't really want to know what it was a clue for. I'll start with dinner then, he said, the first thing that came to mind. Sherlock didn't even look up from the card, but he wasn't reading it. His eyes were out of focus. He wouldn't have memorized it from the first time he had read it anyway. Sherlock, don't... don't worry, he would meant to say. But, really? Look, if it doesn't mean anything, if he's just being a sick fuck, then ignore it. He probably just wants a reaction. Or give it to Lestrade. It might be a clue for something important, or something. There's nothing this could connect to? No? Well, rapes or anything? Sherlock didn't say anything, still staring into the middle distance even as he carefully refolded the card and tucked it away in his jacket pocket. He turned his eyes to John, cataloging him from hair down to socks, then lay back down across the sofa and refused to talk for the rest of the night. Chapter 2 He'd been on guard, of course he had, but as the days had worn on like a badly placed film, John had stopped dreading the arrival of the post so much. There was still the nervous twitch in his gut when he saw handwritten envelopes, only those were inevitably for Sherlock from his myriad of clients. If there was the obvious unease for many new letters, John hadn't accounted for the dull anxiety that wormed its way in his stomach whenever he found Sherlock rifling through his things not bothering to be civil. He didn't say anything, and Sherlock didn't stop no matter how many times he was caught. His previous belligerent but somehow charming curiosity was now more of a sullen, secretive, jealous well-meaning. Miss Hudson appeared to be on it, too, though she smiled innocently and waved off any accusation John managed to even glance in her direction. The only letters he got were spam and from banks anyway, and it wasn't like Moriarty, though God forbid he never got to recognize that psychopath well enough to really know, to play the same trick twice. Will you show it to Lestrade, he asked in the afternoon of receiving the card, as he caught Sherlock turning the thing over and over with deft fingers. Sherlock had sneered. What will Lestrade do? he said, issue a restraining order. He was right as usual. If it wasn't tied to any crime, there was no point in dwelling on it. If all it was was a short letter that almost anyone could write, if they put their mind to it, it wouldn't bother him so much. He was an adult. he dealt with worse than childish harassment before. He'd just be careful, and that was all there was to it. It wasn't like anything more could be done, even if he wanted to. You have an email, Sherlock said, as John came downstairs the next day, not looking up as he serial diluted some clear liquid out of an old jam jar. Mike Stanford, something tedious about getting drunk. John frowned at his back, a token resistance, and went to log on to his laptop to check. It was Mike asking him and a few blokes from their uni days to get together for a meetup, somewhere local. He ignored the feeling in his gut, telling him it was a bad idea, and instead replied with a yes, looking forward to it. He checked his blog and the news. There wasn't anything interesting. It was going to be dry and cold, the weather forecast reported. His bank statement was on the table, where it had been left. Even though he'd opened and looked through everything, John thought with a mild irritation. Sherlock still couldn't be bothered to actually put anything away. Long ago, a few months after they moved in, banking and everything else and men and boring had become John's job and now Sherlock wouldn't have none of it if he was paid to. John picked up the statement and glanced over it, then stopped as he was halfway to the stairs. The total was less than it ought to be. He was fairly sure Sherlock never used his cards, though he knew the pins to all of them. There didn't seem to be anything in the statement that he didn't remember spending, though, and then there was an anxiety again. The stupid anxiety that had been kicking up since he'd realized what that bloody message had actually read. It would be easy enough for Moriarty to intercept the post, 
make an incorrect copy of his statement, and then get that delivered instead. But why? To make John look at his bank account online? To check the older and very latest transaction? And a freaky message would somehow pop up from the bank website? John snorted and ran a hand none too gently through his hair. This was getting too much. He was going to be jumping at nothing soon. He was already jumping at shadows. When cars slowed parallel to him walking on the street, he oughtn't to felt hyper-aware that he didn't have his gun on him. He shouldn't feel like accusing every single piece of mail he received of hiding a secret, perverted message. Personal pep talks for normality were all well and good until the actual doing and believing of them were included. Sherlock was in the bathroom as John passed on his way to his room, for some reason laying on the floor and surrounded by an array of bottles. He was already twisting up to look through the open door when John glanced in, but didn't say anything. His eyes flicked unsubtly to the letter in John's hand. That night at the pub with Mike, Simon, and Baloo, a couple of blokes from his course, both now far more successful than he'd ever been or would be, he had the vague feeling he should probably remember them better, but didn't quite, which somehow felt very likely mutual. He tried to alternately spot anyone who might be Sherlock in disguise and anyone who might be working for Moriarty. Sherlock, of course, had thrown the stroop, but whether he'd actually follow them in disguise was debatable. John tried not to think of what Moriarty might do. Both attempts turned out to be futile, as he realized distantly that he was probably drinking more than he really ought to. He found himself struggling around the logic that Sherlock in disguise would definitely find Moriarty's people, even if they were disguised too, so he oughtn't worry in any case. When he arrived back home, grabbing a glass of water or two before bed, Sherlock shot him a filthy look from where he was perched on his chair, plucking away at his violin in a bizarre and appallingly fast pizzicato. John only grinned at him before he went, just a little unsteady upstairs to bed. He fell asleep quickly and woke with half-memories of his dreams, Sherlock having a hysterically catty argument with one of his old lecturers, mixed with the shrill beeping of his phone alarm, sounding criminally loud in the quiet. John stumbled out of his sleep in his bed, fumbling with his trousers on the back of his chair where he'd left the damn phone in one pocket, cursing as he slid it open and turned off the alarm. Why the hell was a reminder set for bloody four in the morning? Dearest John, the reminder said, look in your phone notes. Kiss, kiss, kiss. John closed his eyes tight shut for a long moment, suddenly feeling very awake. He stood and switched on his bathroom light, calling downstairs for Sherlock, even as he managed to find the appropriate application on his phone. He didn't bother to wait before opening the note. It was the only one written while he'd been at the pub. Sherlock was pushing his way absently into the room, and John ignored him. Dearest John, I want to starve you. I'll lock you in a tiny room with no human contact and feed you only a little salty water. Maybe if I'm feeling generous every few days, I'll add a little sugar. You're so strong that after a week you'll be so hungry as well. After two or three weeks, John... You'll be desperate enough that you'll beg to the empty room because you'll realize that there are cameras in the walls to see and hear you by. Don't worry. I'll ignore both your demands and Sherlock's, since he'll be tearing down London to find you, but I'll watch the footage of you every night to masturbate to. Sometime in the fourth week, I'll let myself into your room. You'll hate me, but you'll be too weak to do anything but paw at my trousers. Please do, John. I'll be so unbelievably turned on if you do, but I'll try to restrain myself. I'll give you a lit cigarette, only one, and for every time you use it to scar your face, I'll throw you a biscuit. I think the first time I do this, you'll refuse, but I'll come back every day with the same offer. You'll do it eventually. I know, because you're practical, and you really appreciate life. I guess that's just the part of why I love you so much. Kiss, kiss, kiss. P.S. I remember what time I had this alarm set, so now you can know that I'm thinking of you right at this moment. <laughs>